Today on Legends of Muskegon Radio, we're interviewing Randy Crow, whose radio and media career extends over 40 plus years. He was a radio DJ on three of Muskegon's most popular radio stations, WTRU, WMUS, and WLCS. He would soon move to full-time radio advertising sales, station management, and part ownership. In 1988, he helped to launch WLCS, Muskegon's first classic rock, a head-to-head -head competitor to WMUS, his recent former employer. This would lead eventually to his founding ownership and where he now serves as CEO of RC Productions Inc., which includes RCP Marketing Ad Agency, Source One Digital, a top digital printer in the United States, and the Gear Group Promotional Products and Apparel Company. In November of 2019, he purchased the Trophy House, Jones Sporting Goods, Lindback Distributing, and Havana Bobs. Today, the Gear Group has combined forces with Trophy House brands to bring a 50-plus year foundation of promotional products, corporate apparel, and sporting goods all displayed in a 10,000 square foot showroom and a 56,000 square foot production facility now serving not only West Michigan but all of the United States. Randy, tell me uh, how and when did you start your radio slash media career? Well, it, uh, I, I would tell you it started by accident. By accident? And, yes. My, uh, I grew up um, from the age of about seven years old pouring concrete. My father owned a concrete business. Mm -hmm. And so our weekends and after school was go to work and finish concrete and do that kind of work. Well in 1973 when I was 13 he come down with lung cancer. They removed a lung, he went back to work. And in 75 cancer come back again and then in 1977 Cancer won the battle and suddenly he was gone, which meant our small company family owned business was gone, the income was gone, no life insurance. Uh, he served in World War II, but you found out that none of those benefits would come your way back in those days. So it was time to go to work and survive, and I was still in high school. And uh, one one journey with my father was 30 some days in the hospital. Mm -hmm. So I had some very good teachers at Mona Shores High School that let me do a lot of work remotely. A couple of them took me under their wing and uh, Mr. Thompson that uh, and Mr. Nye that headed up the DECA Business Club and the Radio Club uh, felt I had a deep voice and asked me if I would like to you know, become part of the DECA program and the radio club program. And before I knew it, I didn't realize nobody else wanted to do the morning announcements. I was drafted to do the morning uh, announcements at school. And from there we built a radio station uh, within the school. Uh, some other you know, great radio legends in Muskegon had come out of WMSR radio, Mona Shores radio. Uh, Michael Siriani, which was AK Mike Stevens on WTRU, WGRD. Uh, so I made my way through that and the way my life worked back then is I went to school from uh, 7 in the morning till noon. I was on a work co-op program through my DECA program so I worked at, had various jobs but the, the one that had meaning to getting me into radio was Vets Clothing. Um, I'd, and while working at Vets Clothing Larry Golumbek, uh, who was my boss uh, and owner, uh, took me under his wing and said, I should introduce you to Fred Tascone. So one day when I come in, there was a business card that says, call Fred. And uh, I called Fred. I think their phone number was 733-2126. And I went over and met with Fred and uh, program director, John London. I think I was 16 at the time, just turning 16, and they offered me a weekend gig. I can remember sitting in this office on these leather couches and uh, they said I'd have to get an FCC license. I had no idea what an FCC license was. And so I said, okay, I can do that. 
and um, they took me in the studio, had me read some lines, and I started uh, the next weekend doing, uh, you know, the, the weekend gig. From there, they moved me to uh, seven to midnight. So now I went to school from seven till noon. Worked at the clothing store from noon to five. Showed up at True uh, by six o'clock to run the hotline program featuring Dave Parks. And um, I'd be on the radio that we signed off at midnight. And by the time I got home, it was about one one o'clock in the morning because you had to do all your meter readings and all your stuff. And I did that from. Um, I guess I was in 10th grade, I did it through 11th grade, and I was still at uh, True uh, doing afternoons. I'd been moved to the afternoon gig, and my clothing uh, store job worked around me. And on top of that, I poured concrete on the weekends for extra money. I was trying to help support my, my mother, who was a stay-at-home mom, and suddenly we've got bills to pay. So, my radio journey... Uh, didn't see it coming, but uh, I've had a lot of fun with it and still enjoy it. And you know, here we are. You used the name Randy Collins. Yeah, there was a conversation. The fact that uh, obviously Larry uh, from Vets had shared with Fred that my father would, was gone and I was still living at home with my mother and. Um, so it was really a weird conversation, you know. Here sits John London, whose real name was Newton Fiat Jr., by the way. Okay. <laughs> so I ended up uh, another meeting with John London and, and Fred, and they knew that my I lived with my mother, and they said, you're going to have to come up with a radio name. And I said, why a radio name? And John London said, well, my name is Newton Fiat Jr. Oh, Okay. So they said, if you were to pick a radio name, what would you pick? Well, my mother's maiden name was Collins. And I figured no one in the community, they said, you know, that way nobody knows who you are, nobody can, you know, and most disc jockeys. Bill, uh, Bill Andrews, it's on the air here middays, his real name's Spaniola. Mike Stevens, it's on in the afternoon, is Michael Siriani. And... I said, but I've met Bill Ecker before, and he is Bill Ecker, right? And they said, yes, he's Bill Ecker. <laughs> okay, so I changed my name. So then uh, uh, John London, the program director, said, I think we should have a little fun with this. You're going to be the youngest jock that we've had on the air here. And we want to put you out in the community. And, you know, they had that super Trudy mobile home thing with the big lips on the front of it and they would take it to various events and you know I was the young hip guy so I got a lot of my pictures you'll see I'm in Trudy and so they changed my name from Colin C-O-L-L-I-N-S to K-O-L-E-N-Z just to give it a unique look mm, okay. and kind of a branding thing so my mother never quite understood that but <laughs> hey it was a job and if that's what the bosses were telling me to do that's what I'm going to do. Could you walk us through your radio media career timeline? We've, you, you told us about how you got the job at True. Where does it go from there? Well, I was on the air, like I said, started weekends, work any shift, and then uh, once, uh, you know, I was still in the DECA program at school and I had won numerous speaking awards. I was always better at speaking than I was writing. Um, and so as I continued to do that and you know a lot of the tenure guys at True didn't like to go out after they worked they didn't want to do the, the events all over town and I'd do them nobody paid you back then to do them you just did them mm -hmm. but so I did True right through uh, was doing afternoons in 79 and you could see all these salespeople coming and going. They had what was called the dungeon there. It really was cool. It had a bar in it. and uh, They'd bring these clients and they'd all chuckle and laugh and hang out. And I thought that's a pretty cool deal. You know, drinking in the middle of the afternoon and you know, thought that was pretty interesting. Plus, you can sure figure out real fast that you know, what I was being paid, I made more money at 10 years old shoveling concrete and sand than I did, you know, 
spending 45s. And what year was this? Uh, 1979. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the people in the office one day, uh, after my shift ended, um, I heard this, this lady, and I'll leave her name out of it, losing a rep at MUS. This uh, lady named Gloria Russell was having some health issues and she was going to leave her job. So I got in my uh, car and I drove to North Muskegon and I pulled in on Giles Road, never been there, drove by there a few times, and a uh, little red building, you know, just sitting in the woods and there was, uh, I knew who Tim Akteroff was and He's standing at the front door trying to figure out how to take the screen out of the front door. Uh, this would have been September, going into October. And, and all of us that know Tim know that, you know, uh, the easiest way to get anything done is with a screwdriver or a hammer for Tim. And I said, uh, you want some help with that? He said, who are you? I said, I'm Randy Crow." He goes, I know that voice. I said, I'm Randy Collins from WTRU. Oh, I listen to you. He says, and he shakes my hand. So the next thing you know, I'm taking the screen out and handing him the screen. And he says, uh, what are you doing? I said, I hear you're looking for a sales rep. He said, who'd you hear that from? I said, a little bird over at uh, True. I said, uh, I'd like to, I, I would like to get that job. So we went into his office and, you know, it was really strange back then. Everybody had these leather couches and you sat down in the couch and they sat up here and they leaned forward and you kind of felt like, holy smokes. <laughs> and so he asked me if I had any sales experience and I said, no, I sell clothing. I worked at a jewelry store for a little while and, you know, uh, I'm top salesman at the clothing store. And he said, well, you know, selling radio is a little tougher than selling suits and I said well probably is and he says well it's hard work it's long hours I said I'm used to hard work and long hours and he said well I've got another person I'm really thinking about hiring." and I said I really want this job and I said you won't be sorry and he said well here's what I'm gonna do I'm gonna send you home with Jason Jennings sales training tapes he said, and here's how it works. You're going to get paid $75 a week and 15% of what you sell. And I can remember thinking to myself, $75 a week is a lot less than I've ever made. Ever. And I really didn't do the math on the 15% until I got home. And it was the fall. My mom's out cleaning leaves up. I come in with this box of tapes, cassette tapes. She said, how'd it go? And I said, well, I think it went pretty good but he wants me to listen to these tapes. So that night I'm sitting listening to all these training tapes. And I'm thinking $75, that's not going to cover too many bills here. And I started saying, well, if I sold $100, I'd make $15. If I sold $1,000, I'd make $150. Well, you start doing the math. So I went back and he said, uh, what do you think? I said, I'm ready to go. So. I uh, gave my notice it true while I also started MUS. I can remember the first day walking in and there you was. You got stuck with me. We all sat in the lobby behind this little folding wall and from there I uh, started selling, still doing commercials, uh, voiceover on some commercials and then I think uh, it was 81 somewhere around in there when the tower was being increased we're gonna go after Grand Rapids um, I think uh, you had a lot to do with with the reason I've got the sales manager job um, and so I was offered that sales manager job and you know I don't think I was that old when I got that job well that was in 85 yeah. so I well was, I was going to Duluth yeah. So. Okay, so I was I had been there a while then. Yeah. Um, so I sold for a while, and basically, you know, Tim being Tim, he would cut the newspaper up every morning, and I was given Nuego. I was given accounts that never wanted to spend any money, and um, I remember one of my first calls turned out to be one of my lifelong clients. 
Uh, still a dear friend of mine, Roger Eikenberry from Plums. Nobody could get Chuck Carlson or Plums on the radio. And I walked in the dungeon there, they were in a basement, and I asked to see Chuck Carlton. He said, he, the girl told me I didn't have an appointment. I said, no problem, I'll wait. And two hours later, I'm still sitting there. And he come out and he said, I don't know what you want, but I'm not buying. I said, well, I really think you should listen to what I have to say because, you know, I noticed when I walked in, there's a lot of shopping carts not being used. And my job is to bring more people in here to the point you have to buy more shopping carts. And he said, if radio was any good, it wouldn't be so cheap. I said, well, if you want me to charge you more, I'll be happy to charge you more. I think at that time our rates were a couple bucks a spot. And you know, four sixty, I think it was. Yeah, I was going to say right around yeah. there. Yep. You get into the packages; they were cheaper. But so he pawned me off on a guy named Roger Eikenberry, and Roger eventually bought Plums. And before I knew, I had Plums on the air, and I had all these businesses in Nuego, and you know, had people that nobody had ever been able to get on the radio on the radio. So from there, the journey continued, and. I started selling and having fun and uh, still getting to play radio from time to time because I, I that's what I did. I recorded my own commercials for potential clients, Cook's Appliance, uh, Speedy Loop, you name the client, I'd write a script on my Underwood 5 typewriter <laughs> and I would then record it on my work tape that's here which can't get my reel to reel to work this morning and I'd go out and that's how I sold because they'd always tell you what they liked about the commercial and what they didn't like so I would say well I'll make these changes to the commercial and here's a program that would run Sunday Monday Tuesday it's an early bird or you know the super shopper that runs Wednesday through Saturday I never asked them if they wanted to buy I just basically you know use the concept of assumption assumption yeah and that worked very well for me and you know I'm proud to say today uh, you know one of my dear friends in Florida is Greg Cook that owned all the Cook stores Roger Eikenberry uh, you know clients that started with me all those years ago are still there um, so from there I took over the sales manager position um, so I'd have been 24 going on 25 and my job was to hire people for Grand Rapids we put an office in Grand Rapids. Um, we hired some pretty dynamic salespeople, and uh, the critics said we would never be able to take on Grand Rapids and the CUZ giants and mm -hmm. all of those. Mm -hmm. um, I think the first year we were just shy of a million dollars. Do you remember what we took out of there the first year? I thought it was close to a million. I bucks. think it was. Yeah. And based on the incentives that. Uh, Tim and Bunker had uh, put in place. And Bunker? Bunker Rogoski, one of the owners. Um, and longtime president. Longtime president. Of the company. Company. So uh, sales were going great. Um, they would put me on incentives, so we kept hiring really awesome salespeople. And uh, we all had fun. I mean, we'd pile in a car at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and head to Chicago and watch a White Sox game and drive back that night after having a lot of fun. Probably wouldn't do that today. Um, and we'd be back to work at 5.30, 6 o'clock in the morning. And that's just the way the game played. Um, and through my job with MUS, I still got to be a disc jockey. Mm -hmm. You know, I could mm -hmm. still do remotes. Did a lot of events at the arena with you. All right. Mm -hmm. Best part of that is we got free tickets and drinks and yep. food. We so, go down on the ice. Yeah, we go down on the ice. With our microphones. With our microphones. And so later on, I think it was uh, approaching 1988, um, you know, some things with, with uh, the ownership at MUS had changed where some of the goals, you know, they felt I was making too much money. And, um, and so... They laid out a plan for going into 89, and the plan was just not realistic. And 
my whole career, my goal is to never go backwards. So I made the decision to leave, and there was a radio station struggling in town. It was called WABX, owned by a couple of attorneys and a guy that owned a hockey team. And uh, I made the mistake of uh, buying into that concept. And I come in with ownership, and we changed the call letters to uh, WLCS, and we love Crow Station. <laughs> I've and, never heard that before. Yep, yeah, that's what it was. And there was a classic rock out of uh, Detroit that uh, I called up and got to know the program director. I thought it was an outstanding station. I think it was, uh, was it CSX in Detroit. Tim would correct me. He probably will correct me. Um, <laughs> Tim Actor. So yeah, so we launched uh, 98.3 WLCS. It was the coolest launch ever. You know, I had all my uh, clients uh, that had been with me. Uh, we turned billboards upside down. We put pieces of billboards up. We had uh, a major trip giveaway. It was the largest trip giveaway that ever happened in this market. And the music was rock and roll. Uh, Bill Spaniola come on as my program director, who was Bill Andrews at WTRU. Mm -hmm. Pulled him out of uh, the career he was in at the time. And I started doing mornings there and selling. And, you know, we didn't have a lot of money. And we basically turned a non-revenue station into a revenue-generating machine. Mm -hmm. The music was good. Um, I had such a great relationship with MUS on my departure, I was actually working for both companies at one time. I wanted to make sure the transition of my clients was flawless at MUS, and never did I, going to LCS, ever encourage a client to quit advertising on MUS. There was just another new alternative in the market that helped you reach more uh, I remember potential. you wrote a letter to your clients at MUS yes. on your way out. Yes. I wrote a letter to all my clients and I said, well, this is the hardest uh, decision I've, I've ever made in my career, which wasn't very long at the time. Um, I love this place. I love country music. You know, 1980, the Urban Cowboy movie, you know, when I started there, changed the face of country music. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I can remember when I give notice at True, Fred said to me, you know, the jury's still out on FM radio. And now FM radio is obviously the powerhouse of the world. Um, so I wrote a letter and I, I told them that uh, while this chapter is closing for me, this is a great operation. Mm -hmm. And um, I wanted to make sure that I left on really good terms. Uh, and we did that and it was weird because they were paying me on my accounts while I was doing my new job, which was just unheard of when you look at today's employment world, the way that it works. Mm -hmm. You know, you just don't see people do that. So from there, uh, I stayed at LCS and the ratings were strong, revenue was strong, um, and you know, obviously you've known me my whole uh, career. Mm -hmm. And we had a situation happen with one of our employees where we thought we had health benefits and she was uh, experiencing a, a miscarriage. So Hackley Hospital called, said that she's asking if you could come down here. Well, I got there to find out that her Blue Cross card was not active. And I said, don't worry about her insurance, I'll sign to make sure that we pay for this. The radio station, there's a mistake somewhere. Well, a mistake, to be honest, and uh, is they were withholding the premiums from the employees but not paying the policy, so we, none of us had insurance. Well, if you know anything about Randy Crow, I'm pretty principle-driven. Mm -hmm. And uh, my relationships are really my lifeline. And if I tell you I'm going to do something, then I do it. And so I went and visited one of the attorneys that day, and I was young, and I was a little temperamented. And so uh, things didn't end well there. 
and I left the radio station that day and when I left downtown Muskegon from the what I call the glass tower that they had mm -hmm. um, I drove by 752 Pine Street and had a for rent sign on it and it said uh, see Dave Bolins next door at his and her uniforms by noon I had rented that office space and Jim Seastrom from Great Lake Signs, I stopped there next, who always put my MUS logos on my Camaros, um, had an RC logo, because RC Productions really started in 1981. It was a voice production company doing commercials for mm. various clients. I was doing a lot of work with Hackley Hospital, mm. narrating a lot of internal Hackley okay. stuff. Car dealers in Kansas City, different, different things along that line. So it's not like RC was new, but it was going to be newer. It was going to become a reality. Mm -hmm. It's going to have to be the survival line at that point. Mm -hmm. So once we got all of our LCS stuff settled out, shortly after that, those guys messed that station up to the point they sold it. Uh, I'm trying to think who they sold it to first. They brought Dan Vandermine and Mike Murphy over there after. I was there and it didn't take long for those guys to figure out that, you know, they didn't know a lot about radio. One thing I realize and respect, Tim Achterhoff and that entire team at MUS lived and breathed radio. <laughs> and you can't have investors that don't understand radio and it's tough mm -hmm. because they just don't get it. Mm -hmm. um, so here we are at RC. Uh, productions and I hired, uh, it's in the back, I, I uh, uh, had a 1967 Chevelle Super Sport that I bought with one of my bonus checks from MUS. Still have that car today. I went to Old Kent Bank and put that car up for collateral and bought the first Mac computer and we were going to get into doing digital graphics and no one said it could be done. Well, I had uh, been in negotiations and I purchased it sitting next to you, the coupon clipper, from a franchise in Grand Rapids. And it was all in color, and this was about the time that the USA Today uh, newspaper went all color. So the goal was that was all going to be done digitally. There I am on the front, and Tim was my co-sponsoring. And the theme behind that, you'd sell ads in that, and you'd run all the commercials on radio and TV, but through my partnership with Plums, you could win, that's 2600 in groceries. The first issue was 5200 100 a week for 52 weeks. Then you'd win cruises, you'd win, you know, I think that one's got Wesco gas for uh, uh, $5,000 cash and gas giveaway. This would have been one when I was leaving LCS. So this was uh, something I was selling on top of everything else. So it, it, it got us into graphics. So from there I hired my first graphic designer, Julie Franzik, who is still mm -hmm. with RCP Marketing today. Mm -hmm. This is 20, 28 years, 20, a long time. Um, 1991. And uh, we built our staff and I think it was 700 square feet of space on Pine Street and I still drive by that um, space and uh, think about how good it was to growth, you know, because now when I told somebody something that it could be the truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, so here we are. Um, you know, RC, I think this year will be the 38th year of RC because uh, that was born in 1981 mm -hmm. as a voice production company. Uh, in fact, my birthday cakes at the MUS 4th of July parties, you guys always put the crow talking into the microphone <laughs> on my cakes. And <laughs> the bir my birthday fell right at 4th of July weekend. We had some good parties there, didn't we? Yeah, we did. And so in 1993, um, or in 92 we moved to this building and what you see was an old condemned building and a friend of mine, Bob Yost, God rest his soul, helped me. We'd take our suits off at 3 o'clock and we'd work till 1 in the morning. We did it for 91 days. 
and we made this facility from a condemned building. I remember Tim Akteroff used to stop here and just thought I was out of my mind. How are you ever going to fix this place? The floors are a mess, the walls are a mess. And so he, as it took progression, he was always impressed that I knew how to do that kind of stuff. And, uh, so I decided that um, I was tired of using MUS as studio uh, to do my commercials. And I had this dream of wanting to have one of the first digital studios in West Michigan. So I called Audio Broadcast Group, which is the company that built the studio that we're sitting in, and I swore them to secrecy that I didn't want anybody in the market to know what I was thinking about. So Mark Stevens, who had worked at, uh, was working at MUS, had worked for major Nashville studios, worked for a major agency uh, in Grand Rapids that uh, Mark had the honor and privilege to work on the Like a Rock with Bob Seeger commercial for Chevrolet. And I had a lot of respect for Mark. So we met for a beer and next thing you know, Mark said, hey, I would I'd love to partner up with you and, and come on this train. So he sketched this studio, I have it upstairs on a napkin, and Audio Broadcast Group built it. It was built in 1993. Um, it was a lot of money at that time. It was pushing over $140,000. And we had the first rolling digital uh, deck. We got the last Rams aboard that come over on the Mayflower. Um, we had multiple reel-to-reels, and our goal was to eventually launch it into television. Because we were doing a lot of television, I used a company in Grand Rapids. So later on, we got right into the TV uh, stuff. And sadly, in 2010, you know, I walked in this studio and Mark was coughing one morning. I said, that's a nasty cough. And he goes, I just can't get rid of it. And nine days later, I kissed his forehead goodbye at the University of Michigan. Hmm. Um, and that was probably the hardest, the hardest thing that I ever went through here. Hmm. I've been through a lot. I've had to tell my friends that work hand in hand with me that they're, someone's passed away in their family um, but losing Mark was a, mm -hmm. a real challenge and we went through a couple cycles of people and the team I have in here right now I know he's up there in heaven this morning smiling because uh, Ryan and Marcus are just hitting the skin right off the ball in here mm -hmm. you know we've got this drone uh, certified drone flyers, we've got all this 4K and you know all of this really cool stuff and they really dig the uh, analog you know the, the Mr. Tim Akterhoff synthesizer if he was here he'd want to fly a jet through the room um, <laughs> and you know a real dedicated sound studio. Today you know RC grew um, with clients, dedicated clients, and Muskegon really did not have an ad agency that wanted to deal with retail sector clients, car dealers, grocery stores, hospitals. Most of the agencies that were in the market at the time all liked that B2B business. It was more profitable, it was easier, you know, and um, I loved helping brainstorm creative ideas and strategies, and so. Here we are all these years later and proud to say we still have clients that started with us on day one. And now we're servicing clients all over uh, the United States, um, which is really cool. And, you know, I've been blessed to keep uh, the real core group that started here. We started with Julie and uh, I think there's 18 or 19 people here at the RCP building. And in 96, we were doing big campaigns for quality farm and fleet um, and signage in five supermarkets across the state and um, digital printing was coming out where you could print on a three foot printer and you could hang the signs in the store and you could bring photographic images to life instead of the old red you know green beans three for a buck you could jazz up the displays 
So we did this big kickoff campaign with quality stores and we got the graphics late. Instead of it looking like a lab, yellow lab dog, it was a dog food campaign. It looked like a pale yellow horse. And so of course the client was mad at us and uh, I said at that time, I said, uh, we're going to have to get in this business. It's the only way we can control quality is if we do it ourselves. So I called a friend of mine, Jim Freed, Signs by Jim, and I said, hey, I'm going to get into this business. I, don't, I want to know if that's going to hurt you. You know, I know you're into vinyl graphics and things like that. So him and I sat down and he said, you have, you know, I think we had three graphic designers at the time. And he said, you know, that's where the whole world's moving. Why don't I sell you my business and we'll partner together. And our whole goal at that time was to service our RC clients. That was the only goal of starting what then was called Source One Signs. Later was changed to Source One Digital. Today, Source One Digital is rated one of the top digital printing companies in the United States. Uh, we work on accounts like NASCAR, NCAA, um, a lot of major retailers. I think today they're shipping uh, signage uh, to Big Lots, uh, Crate and Barrel, did Cabela's uh, for a long, long time, trying to reopen that door uh, with the Bass takeover. So we've been blessed not only to do signage right here all in West Michigan, but a lot of really cool events and signage. So that company has, I think, about 50, some 54 people today. We're in a 25,000 square foot production facility in Norton Shores. Used to all be in this building. Um, and then in November of uh, this year, we, uh, uh, or last year, I'm sorry, had the opportunity to purchase Trophy House. Uh, we had a similar competing business it was called the gear group and John Coy who was one of my clients at MUS uh, contacted me and asked if I'd be interested and I first said no and then I started thinking about it talked to my daughter-in-law Carly and Shan who's been with me a long long time who was heading up the gear group and I said I really have a problem with the Muskegon icon leaving again there's just too many Muskegon icons that have left. I kind of feel that way about radio. All of, all of the icons left, and you know, good, good community supporters. I mean, I grew up, my kids grew up, going to Trophy House and Jones Sports, and you know, it was a place that, you know, when you could go in there, even if it was to look, you were like, wow, this is really cool. Those are CCM hockey skates at Jones Sports, and you know, the old Mohawk jerseys had Jones Sporting Good tags in them. And I just, it just was so cool. And, but it's not making any money, but there's 34 people over there that's called that place home for a long time. So we decided as a group, as a company, to take that task on. And it's, uh, things are definitely, uh, moving in the right direction. Uh, we still have a long ways to go. We have an awesome team over there. Uh, so sitting here today, I would have never, I never would have thought sitting across from you in 1980 that we would have 108 employees. The people you've worked with, not only in radio, but in, in your various media companies, uh, people that stood out in your career, um, talk about them a little bit if you would. Well, obviously, and I, I uh, still see Larry and Renee Golumbek. And without Re Renee and Larry Golumbek, he co-signed on my first credit card. I couldn't afford my graduation pictures. Um, so he had a library in his house, which was really cool. And uh, my uh, girlfriend's sister at the time, took my graduation pictures in his house. Uh, my teachers from Mona Shores bought my graduation cake. Had a party for me. So, without those people at Mona Shores, you know, losing my dad was the worst 
the experience because I really thought he'd live forever and so did he so you know I wouldn't be here today without those people taking that chance mm -hmm. and then you walk into a guy like Fred Tascone that I still talk with Fred from time to time and he still laughs about me you know he got mad at me one time we gave away a 1957 uh, Chevy on the air one night it was my birthday I'm not going to tell you how old because I probably shouldn't have been drinking um, but the station powered down at night so we figured nobody was going to hear us anyway you can only get it a few miles around the circle of the studio at Summit and Getty mm -hmm. Bill Spaniolo's in there, Mike Seriani, Bill Ecker, her, it was, we're just having a good old time. Phone ringing, people wanting to play, say happy birthday, so you play a tape back. And we got on this, and Bill Andrews, Spaniolo started, ah, let's give away. So the next thing you know, we give away a 1957 Chevy. <laughs> that was all fun and games until the next day when somebody calls and wants to know how they get the car. So needless to say, Fred didn't think that was too funny, uh, but it was at the time. Thank God the, uh, the listener was such a diehard true fan. That's one thing I will respect forever. All of, the, all of the listeners that still today will say, I used to listen to you. Used to li you get that. Mm -hmm. You know, yep. used to listen to you. Yep. Loyal, loyal fans. Muskegon, what a great place because people are just so kind. Um, so then you get to the radio station, and without Fred and John London, you know, and I was a kid, and I'm in a Mona Shores radio club, and I'm working with some of the, you know, Stan Wallace, mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. big time morning guy, and they, Bill Ecker, Dave Park, Hotline, who's never heard of Hotline if you're mm -hmm. our age, mm -hmm. um, and they all took me under their wing, and they all taught me things, and... Um, and then when I moved to MUS, you know, uh, you're one of the first faces I met. Mm -hmm. You know, you didn't ditch me off as some young kid. If we had a dime for every conversation we had at Mr. Quick's in North Muskegon, <laughs> and the wisdom you'd give me, and, you know, how many times you get frustrated because you can't sell to some of these people, and, you know, how do you make any money, and, Remember, you used to tell me you got to stay the course, mm -hmm. and uh, and then you you look at the guys on the air there: Jim Cox, John Allen, Tim Watts, Mike Murphy, and I. We had our our times. Um, Dan Mason, um, man, you just walk through all of that. Then you get here, and you think about the Julie Franzics, and you think about the Amys and the Janes and Mark. You know, God love him. And Tim Actoroff, talk about full circle. You know, the guy that's uh, busting the screen door. Uh, come to work here at RC Productions many, many years later. In fact, I think he's 24 years. Mm -hmm. And the way he fixed my flag out front from the wind blowing it out is he just JB welded it right in the holder. <laughs> he never thought you had to stand on a chair to change the flag. <laughs> <laughs> but um, so I've been blessed with clients, uh, relationships. Um, you know, I'm kind of a type A perfectionist person, but I'm as loyal as the day is long. Mm -hmm. And um, I just I wouldn't be anywhere without all of these these people. And you know, my father taught us how to work hard. My mm -hmm. brother and I. Uh, He's been successful in his business. Uh, my mother, you know, uh, she got to see a lot of this. I lost her in 99. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And so... And of course your brother. Yeah, my brother. Um, has had an influence on you. Yeah, he's... I, my brother's probably, you know, he's five years older than I was. He got to go to school. I always wanted to go to college to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But obviously, you know, didn't have any money and you know and uh, Tim put me through Dale Carnegie classes remember those you and I Roy Roy yeah. Winninger right yeah Roy yeah <laughs> your award was winning an ink pen Roger but it was fun you'd get up talk in front of people and a lot of those people become clients yeah 
it's all, you know, and the sales manager training, the CRMC, you know, I was the first one in this market to be a certified radio marketing consultant. I think I was number 904 in the United States. All right. And so... You were a pioneer member of that. You know, it's hard to put your finger on just a few people because there's just, there's so many, and I'm learning each and every day. And, you know, the first time we walked in the NCAA corporate headquarters in Indianapolis and we were selected to be the the championship signage and uh, vendor and you see that stuff on TV or St. Louis Blues, you know, graphics or uh, ESPN. Now, uh, here in two weeks, the Daytona 500, there'll be driver intro stuff. and um, it, it's, it's just it's fascinating um, all the stuff that RCP marketing touches each and every day it's fascinating all the stuff that Source One uh, is doing a client from New York City flew into the Muskegon County Airport last week to just tour our facility that blows my mind and you know and you're just so proud of everyone because I wouldn't be here without uh, all the dedication and the the teamwork and the belief and you know it's just it's just been a I've been very blessed and it's been a good ride yeah you you've had some great stories you've shared with me over the years um, one I definitely a couple but one that jumps out at me uh -oh. <laughs> which is I think very reflective of who you are you told me a story uh, you were, you were creating a red carpet for uh, Hollywood... The Grammys. Grammys. And something had gone wrong. I'll let you take this story. Well, we had this client that uh, was an awesome client. One of our first larger accounts we ever had out of Detroit. Tough client. And he was very connected. We, we actually, through his company, did the Super Bowl... Uh, graphics a lot of them we did it right out of this building um, and we got the call to do some red carpet with a Lincoln sponsorship for the Grammys well we had printed on carpet before with our printers which carpets a unique material and of course that word lead time uh, that word today is obsolete because everything's due today or tomorrow um, so we printed it because we got the files late we printed it we put it in a uh, big giant tube and it come off of we had we were we were very fortunate we had one of the first fabric printers in the United States we had one of the largest uh, 16 foot printers we had some of the first digital cutters um, I really love technology. I want to be on the cutting edge because if you're going to have successful people, you have to give them the right tools. Mm -hmm. Well, the carpet arrived at the Grammys, and while it was curing and drying, it turned pink. Mm -hmm. And needless to say, that phone call was a very hot and heated phone call. And um, I was pulled into the conversation and after uh, Michael uh, got done uh, screaming at me, I said, well, we need to get to work. We're going to reprint this and it will be out there and it will be right. There's no way you'll get it here on time. We'll get it there on time. We're going to start printing right now and uh, we will put someone on the plane. If it has to be me, it'll be me, but we'll put that carpet under a plane. No way you're going to pull that off. I said, We'll pull it off. And we worked. We had to call uh, one of our clients that was doing sewing for us at the time. We worked all night. Uh, that carpet went out, and that client became one of the best referral, most loyal clients that we had until they went in a different direction. I think uh, I think some of the slowdowns of the economy and things uh, got the best of them, but. But by the time you fixed that situation, you lost money. Sure. Yep. Sure. And, you know, but again, uh, no one's ever lost their job here 
uh, for making a mistake. It's how you deal with the mistake that is really uh, changes the game. Mm -hmm. Because there's no sense of debating. There's no such debating if it's FedEx's fault, UPS's fault. Uh, hell, we'd never printed that much carpet before and it had to gas out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when we printed it the second time, we were all standing there with heat guns drying it as it's coming oh, off the, okay. the printer. And then we all prayed over it to make sure that once it got there, it didn't change colors again. Yeah. And we went on to get some very large Lincoln orders after that. But um, No, so still today, um, you know, it's own it. We're not perfect, you know. Uh, we have the most awesome group, but things happen. Especially in that uh, graphics and uh, event business, and unfortunately, the Daytona 500 is going to start at two o'clock. Mm -hmm. So there are some times when you're running a courier, and we've actually uh, bailed one of our wholesale clients out. We printed for an ESPN uh, football event that he was being threatened to be sued. He had told us that he needed a certain amount, but he misread the order and he needed like 400 times the amount Ooh. and the only way we could do it was to print it around the clock and put it in Jim Freed's company truck and drive it there he drove all night he was supposed to wait for me to go with him so I could help him drive but he ditched me <laughs> thanks Jim um, but we made it Gained another client, mm -hmm. saved our wholesale client a lawsuit. Oh. So it's how you, you provide solutions. And that's really at the end of the day, you know, because normally you don't, you know, we grew up with Tim Akteroff. There wasn't a lot of that, a boys. You know, you were expected to do your job, do your job right, mm -hmm. tell the truth, work hard, your integrity, represent yourself and the community. But if you screw something up, you better own it. Mm -hmm. And the radio business was a deadline. We used to boast that you need to change your, your, your commercial. We'll change it. We'll go right in and put it right in the cart rack, and it'll be on the next time that commercial plays. Well, your father, you told me once, what was his role in the concrete that was used in the Walker Arena? Was he the head of it, the supervisor? When they moved here in the 50s from Missouri, um, my dad worked for uh, various asphalt companies and uh, concrete companies and then he started his own mm -hmm. and he actually poured a lot of the concrete in 1960 when the LC Walker Arena, now the Mercy Health Arena, um, uh, was constructed. The Muskegon Mall, a lot of that project as a kid when they enclosed Western Avenue, we did a lot of the concrete work and flat work there. Mm -hmm. um, so I mean, um, I really saw myself um, back over here in the sailor's log from Mona Shores, I was interviewed as a, it's a student finding future in sales, that was off my DECA thing. And mm -hmm. I think my quote at the bottom says, what's your goal for the future? And my goal is to just keep crow cement construction, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm going and growing and uh, often wonder when I get to heaven what they're gonna say because I you know my mom was fascinated when we had the car shows and the air shows and mm. you know you'd be up on a stage with all these people and she was just she just could not believe that you could just step up there and, just and do that it all yeah I love it you know so. the uh, quick story funny story uh, it wasn't funny at the moment at MUS, the fake money story. Oh, you've got a, you actually oh, got an example. Oh. Yeah, um, this one. I'm surprised I didn't lose my job over this one. But we had, you know, we had some competitors out there at the time. I think that's when Sunny FM, Bob Goodrich had put 104.5 on in Muskegon, and they had the Money Man, and they had all this uh, smoke and mirror stuff going, and uh, you know, MUS was it was a dominant station, but yet. You know, there was a lot of, lot of play going on with the ratings and misinformation with clients that they were better than MUS and 
this, that, and everything else. So I had the idea that we would, we were always going to chamber events and after hours events. Tim would, what, I thought we had to have three of us that pretty much everything all the time. Mm -hmm. So I come up with the idea, I put a hundred dollar bill on this side and I put a dollar bill on this side. And when you would go to one of these after hour events full of all of the who's who's in Muskegon, you just nonchalantly set this up by the bar, or you'd set it on the floor, and people would walk around, and we used to just break out laughing. And they would see this, well, somebody would look at it, they'd look around, they'd look at it again, they'd look around, they'd pick it up, some would turn it over, do that, and the next thing you know, they open it, and it says it pays to take a closer look. <laughs> radio advertising is no exception. So all radio stations are not the same. Put your advertising dollar to work for WMUS 107 FM and you'll see the difference. Add up the benefits. All the benefits. Okay? Um, this was a great, I mean, this was a great, you know, mm -hmm. piece up until a uh, front desk girl come in the back in the trailer we got from Deer Park Funland that we added to the side of the building on Giles Road. Mm -hmm. uh, she said there's two guys up front very nicely dressed with federal badges. <laughs> and they want to know who come up with this. <laughs> I said, is Tim here? <laughs> and she said, no. So I walked up front and there stood these two very serious gentlemen and I said, hi, my name is Randy Crow." And uh, the girl handed this back to the federal agent. He said, uh, is this your doing? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, we have a problem with this. This is uh, something about currency and, uh, you know, this is just not, uh, not kosher. And he said, who printed it? And I said, well, sir, I'll take full responsibility for this because this was my doing. I wasn't going to give up our printer because it was my idea. <laughs> and so he said, how many of these did you print? I thought for a second, do I tell him how many or do I just tell him not many? I said, 5,000. He said, 5,000? I said, yes, sir. How many do you think you have now? You remember, we blanketed the market with these. Mm -hmm. We mailed them. Mm -hmm. We, I mean, mm -hmm. they were everywhere. We told everybody, you go to a bar, you go to a movie, you go any place <laughs> you go, leave the money. Yeah. Because they were the money man over at 104.5 and we're setting the facts straight, right? So I went and I got the boxes, the ones I had left, and he said, we are going to uh, do an investigation on this and we will be in touch and we will let you know what the repercussions of this is going to be. And, you know, who is the station manager? And, you know, we'll have to get with him because we'll need your FCC license and all this. And I'm thinking, oh my God, mm. I am sunk. <laughs> And somehow, when they talked to Tim, I don't know if he gave them Deer Park tickets, you know, or uh, <laughs> sent them on a trip, or what he what he did, but this kind of just kind of nonchalantly disappeared. I'm not sure he ever told uh, the president and the owner Bunker Rogowski and Mike Boonster that this had rolled out. Uh, but needless to say. I don't really have this right now. <laughs> so uh, maybe we should edit that out. <laughs> no, that was that was a that was a classic. <laughs> Scary, but a classic. Oh yeah. But again, I owned it. I told them I did it. I told them how many. Didn't give up the printer because I just I knew that the printer would be in a lot of trouble. And it, he was just trying to fulfill, you know, MUS was a great client of that printer yeah. at the time. Yeah. And you said he was skeptical. 
He didn't want to do it to start with. Right. Yeah. <laughs> he told me he couldn't do it, and I said, "Come on." So, yeah, little persuasion worked. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Any other stories that jump out? Uh, I uh, let me ask you an odd question here. You you came over to MUS to sell advertising. Did you approach Fred Tascone about that idea ever? No. You know, because I felt, I guess I just really never put two and two together because the true staff were all icons. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had Bill Ecker, Ramona Ganey, mm -hmm. Fred Tascone, mm -hmm. uh, trying to think of uh, uh, Sandy, uh, Fred's wife was uh, key in that operation. Mm -hmm. They had some real long term, but they were the giant. Mm -hmm. I mean, think about it. They were. The Big 16 was the Huge. giant. Yeah. And um, so, you know, and then over the years I had a chance to go to TV 13. And uh, remember Tim telling me everything that glitters is a gold. And uh, I'm glad I didn't take that job because uh, actually Dave Weehy took that job and they come in and cut the account list into small little section so you'd have never made the money that was promised there. Mm -hmm. uh, and Dave Weehy replaced me when uh, I uh, I left uh, MUS. So, yeah. interesting. interesting journey, isn't it? Oh, amazing, Randy. You've had an amazing career. The uh, Which leads to our last question, I guess. Um, you, you've touched on this earlier. How would you want people to describe you and your career? Um, how would I want them to or how would they? <laughs> well, that could be a loaded question. Well, like, um, I, would, I think how would you want them to see you? I, would, I guess what I would, I would want someone to say is um, Randy Crow is very loyal, very dedicated, um, cares about people, but he has high expectations, and um, you know, I think uh, at the end of the day, all we leave here with is our integrity, and you know, because of my deep voice, some some people may say that I'm a little. Uh, I think my temperament's a lot better than it used to be because when you're type A and a perfectionist is pretty challenging. Um, but I think that, that dedicated, loyal, um, I, I'd be very proud of that. Very cool. So, uh, Thank you, Randy. Well, thank you. This has been great. Uh, this is another edition of Legends of Muskegon Radio, featuring this interview of Randy Crow. Thank you. Muskegon weather mostly cloudy today with scattered showers and thunder showers through tonight. High today 75, low tonight around 60 and cloudy tomorrow with more showers, high 82. Right now under cloudy skies, 68 degrees with Randy Collins in Chicago on True. Say charge it. True Sports reports the Tigers over Seattle by the score 9-2. The White Sox by the Red Sox by the score 4-1. And the Cubs over San Diego by the score 9-6. Lottery winner was 0-4-6. Here's Golden Grassroots from True. This reminder, a car wash for muscular dystrophy will be held at the 7-Eleven on Norton and McCracken today, August 18th from 10 to 4. Car wash is just a buck, so go on up and get your car washed. Here's Tommy James and Dragon the Line. WTRU's coming attractions for next hour of the main event. Fight song theme with Ricky Lee Jones, Maxine Nightingale, Leave Me On, John Stewart, and more of your favorites. Glenn Marshall's next at 12 noon. Port City weather this afternoon and tonight mostly cloudy with scattered showers and thunder showers. High this afternoon 75, low tonight around 60. Cloudy with scattered showers and thunder showers tomorrow. High around 82. Right now it's cloudy and 69 degrees. A true WTRU. Good morning, 11 minutes after 6 o'clock. Brandon Collins in the Port City where it's going to be warm and humid with scattered showers and thunder showers. Throughout the day and tonight and along with Monday. High today getting up around 
Friday night with Randy Collins and Eddie Rabbit and pour me another tequila.